Good evening, uh, dear colleagues, and good morning, good afternoon, greetings of the day from wherever part of the world you are joining this meeting from. We welcome you all to the um, Global Asbestos Awareness Week 2022. And uh, this webinar has been, this, this program has been carefully put together by OSH Africa in partnership with Adao Foundation, uh, National Institute of Occupational Health South Africa, and the uh, African Union Development Agency, and ESH Africa as our media partner for this very event. The essence of this event is to further reveal the, play, the, the, the state we are currently in globally in the state of asbestos and its ills across the world. With the time we have at our disposal, we'll be doing review, highlight of what has happened in different regions and in different countries, the risk asbestos pose to workers and what has been done differently across different location and geography. So uh, today we have very um, distinguished personalities. We have been able to put together uh, our speakers and panelists to do justice to do this program. So dear colleagues, I welcome you all to this meeting. So while we start this meeting, uh, I will call on um, um, the Vice President of OSH Africa, Dr. Tutula Bafo, to give a, an opening remark while we start the meeting. Dr. Tutula, please. Thank you very much. Uh... President, and uh, good afternoon, evening, good day to everyone all over the world. Um, it's a pleasure for me to uh, also, you know, welcome you and uh, add my remarks to what the president has said. I must say, uh, some of us, uh, we don't get this title very often. So thank you to Osh Africa, Vice President. Um, I would like to, on behalf of OSH Africa, uh, say that this is a very welcome development. It's the first uh, webinar that we are having as OSH Africa. And as he has said, it is in a collaboration with a number of organizations, uh, Adawa Foundation, uh, NAYO South Africa, and also the AU Development Agency, NEPAD. So we'd like to thank those organizations for making this very easy and very light for us. As you are aware, as OSH Africa participants, there was a survey, a survey that was conducted and uh, most of you did indicate that Friday evenings were a good time as well as Saturday. So we decided to go with the Friday and see how it goes. And right here, we have got about 57 people. Um, I believe this is a good turnout, considering that Friday, um, not Friday, sorry, um, this time it's not a, a Friday, but in our next sessions, we will be targeting Friday. And we do hope that we still have a good turnout. Um, because a lot of people on Fridays, we are migrant workers and we actually travel. Oh no, it's Friday, it's, it's apologies. You know, the week has been bad for me, I can see. But I'm trying to say that Fridays are a very difficult day for a lot of us because people travel to the rural areas and sometimes we don't have reception. So the 60 that I see now here actually is good. And we hope that as we go along, we are going to improve. We are looking at hosting webinars every quarter. So this webinar is going to count towards our first quarter. And in the next quarter, we are going to organize another one. The topic is very uh, important in that asbestos still causes a lot of um, ill health. In, on the continent. It has been banned in a number of locations, but we still use asbestos. And therefore, today we need to be looking at 
how are we continuing to mine asbestos when actually we have got major health challenges with asbestos? And uh, we have a very good panel which is going to uh, you know, inform us about what it is that is possible uh, in working with asbestos. I will not mention the colleagues, but we would, I would particularly like to acknowledge those who are from uh, outside the continent, which is Ms. Linda Reinstein, and who is also quite a, a, a very leading person in the organization of this webinar. To the colleagues from the region, um, uh, Dr. Moyo um, and Mr. Bakare, um, we appreciate you here. Uh, Mr. Koza, I'm actually, um, you are a global, an African citizen. We don't see you as uh, someone who's from South Africa, even though NEPAD is in South Africa. We see you as an African. So on that note, Chair, I would like to hand over to you and uh, wish all of us a great evening today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tutula, for a very resounding uh, uh, welcome address. Uh, we thank you so much for, for that. While we, while we start the program right now, I need to let you know that, I mean, we had very good registration, over 230 persons registered for this uh, webinar, and we are hopeful that a number of them will still turn up, I mean, afterwards. But why, why, we, why we, we, we still wonder the risk of asbestos across the world? I want to quickly bring this um, statistic to your notice that over 125 million people in the world are exposed to asbestos risk in their workplaces. And in Africa, data gap is still a big problem. We don't have enough data on asbestos in Africa, and that has led to a whole lot, I mean, of, of that allow asbestos use, I mean, highly in Africa. Like research puts it, for, for over 100 years, Africa was the highest exporter of asbestos to the whole world. And I, I saw that report earlier on, I was really disturbed. And uh, we are all aware of the risk that's, that's in, inherent in asbestos and uh, the carcinogenic substance and all that is related in asbestos exposure. And when you look at this, your, your first guess, it will be what in all this, how come uh, government of different countries are not speaking out, I mean, against this, this very um, dangerous substance. But we have in our midst a very renowned personality who will be telling us more about this in due time. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I want you to join me, if you can, in a loud ovation, as I welcome uh, Linda Raisting, the CEO of Adao Foundation, to give her presentation. Linda, please. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ehi. I am excited to join you in Africa. I just wish we were sitting around a, a table where we could really talk and see each other's body language. Uh, connecting and sharing is such a powerful tool. And Africa, as you folks know, is a continent very close to my heart, whether I'm in Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, or Tanzania, Egypt, you folks get it right and do it so well. So congratulations to uh, Africa for all the great work. Uh, I think pictures can be worth a thousand words. Uh, I have a bad habit, so I hope you'll forgive me. I tend to talk very quickly. So we've made some slides so that hopefully what I'm telling you will have a picture that you might see, feel, remember, or even share, which I think sharing for Ehi and I, and of course, Wally, is so important. That being said, I am gonna share my screen and run through a very brief PowerPoint. I promise you it will not be death by PowerPoint. Uh, it's just meant to be a marker of some ideas. So he had this great idea. He said, Linda, how about we do a webinar right after Global Asbestos Awareness Week ends? And no one can do this better than Ehi. I said, sure. So we put together this webinar and it's all about partnering for prevention, which is what you folks at, at OSH Africa and in other interest entities do so well. 
So I want to say thank you. Uh, and it's very impressive. I'm proud and I look forward Ehi, to continue to share the recording of this important first ever Global Asbestos Awareness Week webinar with OSH Africa. So for those of you who I haven't met, I'm Linda Reinstein, the co-founder of the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. Uh, and uh, we are an independent nonprofit dedicated to education, advocacy, and community support. We are the largest nonprofit in the United States dedicated to preventing asbestos exposure to and all asbestos-caused diseases. So why did I co-found ADIO? Well, like many of you, asbestos touched our family. As you can see in this older photograph, my late husband, Alan, with our daughter, Emily, we lived what we thought was just a perfect, idyllic dream life in our town in Manhattan Beach. And this slight persistent cough that Alan had ultimately led to a diagnosis of mesothelioma. I don't know how many of you have experienced the impact of asbestos, but it's a disease that most of us have never heard of can't pronounce or spell, and soon find it is debilitating, aggressive, and deadly. At that time, Alan was just 63, so active and strong, he elected to have a radical surgery, which many people in the United States don't have access to, and you might find this similar problem in Africa. Alan had a left rib removed, his left lung resected, the lining around his heart was stripped off, the pericardium, and his diaphragm was surgically replaced. This was all for more time with us. As you can see on the bottom, my husband passed away in 2006. He's gone, but will never be forgotten. And our work continues today, both professionally and personally, to make sure every victim ever silenced by asbestos has a voice and their families have a home. So let me keep going here. Uh, technology sometimes is wonky. So when I first started going to Washington and the first trip was with my daughter, Emily, I saw staffers at, at working for senators and house members looking confused about asbestos. I don't know how many of you have had a conversation about a nearly invisible fiber, but it's tricky. So I had a scientist make me this so-called penny slide, and you can see under President Lincoln's nose 20,000 chrysotile fibers compared to human hair and grades of rice. Once I had this, this educational resource, it helped me to get staffers attention because if you don't know what asbestos is, where it might be, and what to do, how do we prevent exposure? The United States has a long, tragic history with asbestos. Uh, we are still allowing imports and use to continue. This slide, I'm gonna make all my slides publicly available also, but you can see that we've known for over a hundred years that asbestos exposure was linked to disease, suffering, and deaths. We have failed Americans in the United States, and I hope Africa can learn from the United States where we have had failures, but how can we turn those into successes? You can see on this slide at the, at the very top, Dr. Selikoff was a pioneer and amazing physician who really came out in 64 talking about, about the biological effects. But these are important dates to see that unions knew in 1926, Dr. Selikoff knew in 1964, the EPA tried to ban it in 89, but we know how powerful money is. And we are still working to shape public policy in the United States. We do not have a ban. But this week we got some great news and Ehi was, was there to help us celebrate. Uh, it is a victory lap, but not end of a project. The EPA released what's called as a proposal, proposed rule. But you're gonna, for those of you who understand about asbestos, there are six common fibers known as asbestos. The EPA is going to try to ban one of them, chrysotile asbestos, for six conditions of use. Now you might be thinking, what is she saying? There are six. You're right. I'm saying there are six fibers and we're not, we're only doing a, a small portion of the job. More is needed. I think you all know by now that asbestos is a known human carcinogen. 
There is no safe level exposure. And don't let anyone tell you that chrysotile is just a little less deadly than the amphiboles. They are wrong. And it's important to get our facts straight. And Ehi and I will make sure that all my resources are widely shared. So can you believe this slide? This is kids' crayons. How many of you are parents? I am. This slide shows that we've done product testing four times, ADO and our colleagues, and we've confirmed, confirmed that asbestos contaminants can be found in crayons. And what's happening? Nothing. We still allow imports and use to continue. So what we're finding now in the United States, and I think this might help us to collaborate even more with Ehi and Wally and Vani and others, is because the United States used so much asbestos up until 1973, and we're still importing it today, it's called legacy for us. Asbestos can still be found in homes, schools, workplaces, consumer shelves, in cars, and you know what? When there's a natural disaster or a, or a man-made disaster, doesn't matter which, if the asbestos is in a structure and it either implodes or it needs repair, there can be exposure there. And we know this because our firefighters develop mesothelium at twice the rate. So let's talk for a second about who's making this problem worse. Well, let me just tell you, there are five countries and those from Zimbabwe, I'm not calling you out. Uh, Russia has always been the leading exporter of mining company mining asbestos and exporting it. And you can see they're surrounded by their dear friends in Kazakhstan and China. Brazil has made great progress in banning asbestos, but the industry is very powerful. There's still courtroom battles about mining and exports. Zimbabwe sadly uh, wanted to reopen a mine and I totally get the economics behind asbestos. But if a country is going to mine, I think it would be important to educate the Zimbabweans so they have proper education and, pre and protection. So no one is become sick like my husband or the 250,000 people that die every year around the world. So take a look at this slide. Let me know how you feel. Donald Trump's image is wrapped around uh, pallets of asbestos from Russia. The Russians took his image and Trump loved, obviously, President Putin once upon a time. They made this graphic that says approved by Donald Trump, 45th president. Donald Trump has a terrible reputation of thinking asbestos was useful, and it was actually used against the United States, everyone's work, and it was a promo for Donald Trump and his love for asbestos. It just shows you how far the industry will go to use propaganda, misinformation, and disinformation. That being said, let's talk about the asbestos impact globally. As Ehi said, about 250,000 workers die every year. Now think about this as workers, because that's where the data, and it's very hard to collect the data, it usually comes from trade unions, which I love, love, love organized labor. But it is very hard if you live in a rural community, maybe you have environmental exposure, maybe your company doesn't track exposure or give you preventative methodologies. It is very hard to truly get the data. Now think about the economic loss and access to care. So Alan and I lived in Los Angeles when he was diagnosed. We had many medical centers to choose from. We were very fortunate. But not every person in the United States has access to one of the 10 centers of excellence that we have in the US. So what does that mean? It means you might not get the treatment you need. It means your disease might not be uh, recorded. And I want you to think about this, that set nearly 70 countries have banned asbestos and the US is not on the list. So we need to work together. Now, hats off to Africa, seven countries have banned the uh, asbestos. And I know Wally and Ehi will, will name and describe some of the great work, but collectively, we have a lot of work to do in Africa and the United States together. So this slide is a little noisy with data, but I just wanted you to give a reference out from 1990 to 2015, you can see that asbestos deaths were primarily caused from lung cancer. Asbestos caused lung cancer, followed by mesothelioma and then asbestosis. 
We commonly in the United States consider five different types of diseases. Uh, we obviously look at lung cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, laryngeal cancer, mesothelioma, asbestosis. So I'm happy to provide a list and some of the early warning symptoms, Ehi and Wally, to anybody who might want this information. Now, I want you to think that we talked about globally 250,000 workers die every year, but I want you to think, see this beautiful face? Her father didn't do anything wrong. He may come home from a job with asbestos on his clothing, and he's so excited to give his daughter a hug, but he forgot to change his clothes. Maybe he wasn't uh, educated that he needed to decontaminate. Well, this is what I call take home exposure from a deadly hug. So not only do we have to educate workers, we have to educate their families, their communities and others. So it's pretty exciting this week. And my intern on this call, Shelby, helped me work on this. And he was a great partner. Uh, we worked on this on the 18th Global Asbestos Awareness Week content and use social media. It was nothing less than a great success because of all of you. So what do we do? Well, we get together in collaboration, as you know, is one of my favorite my favorite areas to focus on. So clearly it's all about collaboration, communication, and yes, action. So partnering for prevention, we shared our asbestos stories. How many hundreds of thousands of Allens are there? Do we know them? Have we lost their voice? How are their families? We share all stories. Uh, social media is a huge tool and infographics help us to reach audience where maybe our language isn't spoken in the same dialect, but a picture is understood. Once again, ADO uh, translated our press release and videos into Russian, Hindi, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. So we feel that if we can reach other countries with educational resources, we can knock down those access, those barriers to education. And art and advocacy, if you know me, you know that's one of my favorite things. What can we accomplish with art? How about music? How about a photograph? Stay tuned for more. I'm going to come back to Africa in about a month. So help me with the U.S. I need Africa and I want to help you. So if we think about the United States and they tried to ban asbestos almost more than 30 years ago, and we failed. What does that do to Americans? They're so confused and misunderstand that asbestos hasn't been banned. It creates exposure pathways just by lack of education. There have been five five Allen Reinstein ban is best as now acts every two years they have to be introduced because of our process with the legislature and we've had 17 asbestos awareness week resolutions where we write them we get a champion in the senate and all of the facts that i gather together are voted on unanimously about how dangerous asbestos really is so why is that important well it's important building block to the foundation of adio I really like to believe that we have no, no boundaries and no borders. Collectively, we are one. And Wally and Ehi have presented at our conferences, and I know others hopefully will join us and or present at other conferences. But that's this is how we work through collective activism. If we can embrace education, advocacy, and community support, if we can take education to the next level so that everyone has access to what OSH Africa knows, can we prevent exposure to eliminate disease? I say yes. So we're working on our September conference. Everybody will be able to join us virtually at no charge. And like Ehi, we believe in Zoom conversations, which are really fun. I see Debbie Meyer coming in right now, and she has a wonderful magazine. I don't know if she can hear me singing her praises, but you all want to get Debbie Meyer's uh, magazine from Africa. We are big on digital storytelling. If I just showed you a, a, a statistic that in 20, 2006, uh, 40,000 Americans died of cancer and Alan was part of that. Would you care about Alan, Emily, our family? I think probably not, but I think our stories, our pictures, our graphics help to bring our stories together. ADO has monthly newsletters. They're all free. 
And we really believe asbestos as, as with asbestos and art festival. So again, stay tuned. I'll be giving Ehi some information about that later on. So let me tell you, it's not easy. And yes, I have to dye my hair. I am almost gray. Asbestos won't just kill you. It makes your hair turn gray. But I'm saying that playfully for you to know that we work on many different planes to get to the uh, end result. We, we be, I really believe that it's not just legislation, public policy. We've had to use legal action to move asbestos policy forward. ADO has sued the EPA three times, three times, and we've won. We've won each time, and that is why the EPA is now doing their job and issuing various rules and proposals. What does that mean for you? I don't know. I hope that one American woman story will inspire you, encourage you, and, and bring you to the table of collaboration. Debbie is on this call now, so hopefully she'll share a link to her magazine later on, which is terrific. But I want to think about what is your vision for partnering for prevention? What do you want to do within your, your country, within Africa? Or how can you help the United States ban asbestos? And then think about how can Osh Africa and ADO help you? So this isn't the, just the end of Global Asbestos Awareness Week. This is the beginning of a partnership with all of you. And I truly believe Margaret Mead's word, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful and committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you for giving me the time today to share my story, to highlight some facts. And I look forward to con con continuing the conversation this morning with you. And Ehi, thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. What a brilliant presentation. That was mind blowing and we really appreciate it. I like the fact that uh, you shared very exciting uh, statistics. And as, as you rightly mentioned concerning Africa, seven, seven countries in Africa has really done legis legislation against asbestos. And those countries are Algeria, Djibouti, Egypt, Gabon, Mauritius, Mozambique, and South Africa. Why am I really not these names? If your country is not was not listed among the list of the countries that have banned asbestos, it is your moral responsibility to go back home and hold the policymakers accountable. We saw we saw a man that came from work. I mean, that was exposed to asbestos. It is not a crime for a man to come back from work and hug his child. But accidentally, that child was exposed to asbestos. So we all owe it a moral responsibility. We'll do what we can in ensuring that we are able to stay alive and keep our life going. Linda, thank you very much. That was a very brilliant presentation. Lest I forget, um, we have we have a hashtag for those who want to tweet as as the as the as the webinar is going on. Is it's already on the on, on the on the chat chat room, but it's hashtag twenty twenty two G A A W. So we need to. And any any anything you feel like like taking from all the message, take and tweet, punchline, tweet them. We need the world to hear about all that we're doing. Once again, Linda, thank you so much. That was that was mind blowing. Thank you. Andy. Here we 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 will bring in. Um, thank you're welcome. We will bring in the the, the, the panelists uh, up now. We have in our midst uh, Mr. Wale Bakari. Wale Bakari is a Nigerian. I mean and Osh expert that's so renowned. We are all proud of him for the great work he has done. He has done so much, I mean, even in the field of asbestos, and we are happy to have him in our midst today. Wali Bakari, it's good to have you. We are welcome to the panel. Thank you very much, Amy. Okay. We, have, we also have Dr. Moyo Dingani. Dr. Moyo Dingani is, is is a known name in Africa. He's done so much work as it concerns occupational health and safety. Uh, he is a fellow of occupational and safety from Royal College of Occupational Health. And he is um, a lecturer in Baines University in the field of occupational health and a visiting lecturer to University of Wits, South Africa. 
And again, Dr. Moyo is also the Secretary General of OSH Africa. Dr. Moyo, you're welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. Greetings to all our audience. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Then we also have Ms. Chiwenwe Chamdimba, who is a policy expert from Africa Union Development Agency. We've been talking until the last minute. He had another conflicting official assignment that needed her to be physically present. But she has carefully delegated a colleague from Africa, Africa Union Development Agency, uh, who also works closely with her in, in policy as it concerns her uh, in Africa. Help me welcome Mr. Norma Koza from Africa Union Development Agency to the panel. Norma, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Good evening and good morning to everyone. Excited to be here and I'm ready Thank to you learn. so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So, so we'll, we'll start now. Do, uh, Okay, thank you, Norma. Dr. Mo, you just gave us about two minutes insight, maybe two minutes insight of your view as it concerns asbestos exposure in African workplaces. Places. And linking to the fact that Africa has been the, the biggest exporter of asbestos for over 100 years, this is painful. and and. Where do we go from here? I mean, with all that Linda has brought up, knowing the ills and the and the risk involved, what do you think we can do differently as it concerns this thing going forward? Thank you very much, A. I I think uh, this is quite an important subject. Um, what is important to note is that uh, it cannot be solved in isolation of the broad um, uh, programmatic and systematic approaches to occupational safety and health. I think you all agree with me that uh, access to occupational health and safety services is at a significant low, below 15% the world over. And more so even in the African space, the access will be much, much less. So we are coming from a background where the entrenchment and the embrace of holistic occupational safety and health management systems at workplaces is still at its infancy stage. And one of the strategic um, <clears throat> uh, paradigms that need to be embraced is to see the development of organized uh, occupational safety and health services such that all the occupational uh, and safety issues will be <clears throat> managed in a holistic framework rather than in a fragmented issue. Asbestos is an uh, uh, occupational hazard. Um, like has been mentioned that there's been quite a lot of use and only seven countries in Africa have banned the use of asbestos. And one, more, one important issue in terms of addressing these issues right from the outset is to uh, oversee the genesis of fundamental occupational safety and health services so that issue occupational hazards are managed in a, in a systematic way by all countries. We are aware that uh, in terms of uh, management of occupational hazards in the workplaces, you need to look at the hierarchy of control, your elimination of occupational hazards, as well as um, substitution, engineering controls, all the way to uh, personal protective equipment. So as one of those occupational hazards, it is quite important that uh, countries look at a holistic view. There's, there's been quite a lot. Asbestos is one of the major problems. Other occupational hazards are major problems. So we need countries to focus on their systems in terms of occupational safety so that we see the, we begin to see a new era where the genesis of organized and comprehensive and systematic approaches to occupational safety and health are being implemented across Africa. Otherwise, in the absence of that awareness, Hazards um, from asbestos, um, mining exposure, who continue to be with us. And uh, as you are aware that even right now, what's currently happening in terms of the deaths from asbestos, these are stem even from many years of exposure, looking at the latency period of um, uh, asbestos and even other occupational hazards. So if we do um, 
certain uh, solutions that uh, we need to embark on in terms of elimination uh, of asbestos or, or the occupational hazards in the workplace, uh, that will go a long way in the future generations because most of these hazards are chronic in nature. Thank you so much. I'll come in uh, later on. Thank you so much, Dr. Moyo. That was, that was well put together. Thank you so much. So, uh, Noma, Mr. Nomakosa, I'll come to you here. Um, according to WHO, data gap in Africa, in Africa region, regarding occupational exposure to asbestos and asbestos-related diseases have been a very big issue. And this data gap and competing priorities have not allowed countries to ban mining and the use of asbestos. I'm putting this to you because I know that mining is stronger in, in Southern African region. I mean, where asbestos exposure is still on the high side. What is your position on the, on the state of asbestos use uh, exposure in Southern Africa, mostly in the field of mining? Please share with us. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think from our position as African Union, Firstly, we acknowledge that, um, you know, asbestos is both occupational and also public health issue in our con continent. And it has been a problem actually for quite some times. But as I've mentioned that this is an occupational health problem as well, is that um, I think, as you know, uh, he, that in the corridors of African Union, we have got limited understanding in terms of occupational health and safety. As we are sitting right now here, we are lacking, you know, even key, you know, policy documents or political, you know, um, understanding and commitment in terms of, you know, occupational health and safety and asbestos is part of that area as well. We have, you know, few, you know, uh, public health, you know, um, commitments here and there, but it's not enough actually to address even the problems that we're having. And also a lump to that, I know that poverty also, it plays a role where we prioritize, especially in terms of I mean, production and getting you know, uh, jobs for our people and regard and disregard actually um, the occupational health and safety and also as best tools. So from our point of view, actually, I think we need to start from the point of policy um, in terms of addressing these issues. You know, as it has been already um, um, presented that only seven countries in Africa actually that has you know, published, you know, um, um, or who, who has banned, you know, asbestos. And I know that a couple of other countries have, as well that un, unofficially has banned, you know, asbestos in their countries. But I think we need to stay, stay, take that. But also, I think when moving forward, for me, actually, I think we need to take the awareness sessions to parliamentarians, actually. Um, I mean, apart from, you know, speaking to the right people, actually, I think we will be also talking to ourselves, but I think we need to take to parliamentarians actually these awareness to make sure that they understand exactly. But also I welcome, you know, idea you actually for the presentation that they've made and especially when it comes to messaging and packaging as well. I think it's high time that we need to package our message in such a way that, you know, um, the parliamentarians will really understand us. Because um, at times, actually, I think we are talking to ourselves and we are not, you know, targeting the real people actually that needs to be targeted as well. And I think ministries of finance, actually, that, that's where we need to target them because I think that's where the problem comes from, actually, because we are balancing between you know, the economy and the health of the people at the same time. But we need to take that message to that area. So, Ehi, thank you very much. I think that is our position. We need to look at the policy level uh, in terms and, and political commitment in terms of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Norma. I'm happy you are you are you brought that point off in I mean in terms of policy. We really need I mean policy um, realignment in Africa in terms of um, not just not just asbestos alone, but occupational health. Where we have also established that asbestos exposure is also an occupational health issue. Thank you so much, Norman. That was very brilliant. Uh, uh, Mr. Wale Bakari, uh, I, I come to you now. I know you 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 from Nigeria, you live in Nigeria and Nigeria hasn't been listed as one of the countries that have that have clearly uh, uh, placed a legislative ban on asbestos. And I know you have done a lot of work along this line. 
how do you think we can engage policymakers in our country? And also, I want to hinge that with the fact that asbestos is still in high use in Nigeria. You, you understand that. And in, in, in terms of building maintenance and even construction work, asbestos components are still found in what we use here in Nigeria. And even in terms of demolition of old buildings where asbestos were used, how do we supervise this in Nigeria? What was the best way in, in, in ensuring that even the transportation of the asbestos that were used in the demolished building, they are safely transported without further exposure to people who have who have reasons to, to have contact with these materials? Please share with us your views. While you are muted. Uh, sorry about that. Thank you very much, Ayi, and uh, very well spoken, uh, Norman. And, uh, right, uh, like you rightly said, um, Nigeria is not officially listed as one of the countries that has banned the use of asbestos uh, because, frankly, we have not. Okay, so, yeah, but the thing here is this, uh, as far back as 2011, the, um, there has been a regulation in place all right, uh, the National Environmental Construction Regulations of 2011, section 14 of that regulation actually addresses asbestos. And I think that is probably the only um, legislative instrument you will find in the country that directly talks to asbestos, all right? And under that regulation, uh, asbestos use uh, has been discouraged, okay? It's been more or less banned but only specific to the construction industry and not um, nationwide or industry-wide. And that is, I think, one of the problems that we're going to have. Now, the challenge is this, like you have asked, how do we get this to become a national all-encompassing ban? Um, from my experience, there are a couple of, there are a couple of uh, challenges that we face. One is the acute lack of awareness, even amongst the people that should be legislating. And uh, when you talk to them, or you try to make them understand uh, the danger inherent in the use and handling of asbestos, uh, the first thing they think about is the asbestos roofing sheets on the homes in the villages and uh, why is everybody not dead? Uh, <laughs> In 2015, the commissioner for um, uh, the commissioner for works in Lagos State. Lagos State, for those um, listening, is the commercial capital of Nigeria and is home to 22 uh, million people or thereabout, uh, the fifth biggest economy in Africa. And the commissioner for works in Lagos State, um, when talking about asbestos during um, and environmental awareness week um, talking about the fact that you want people to stop using asbestos uh, containing materials uh, for roofing purposes. And they advise them to go remove all the asbestos roofs in their homes and get rid of them. And that generally, um, it's indicative of the challenge that we have. Okay, this gentleman said, uh, you know, thought he was doing something good. Just go to your homes, go rip off all the asbestos containers that you got, and, and put them in the, um, in the in the skip in front of your homes, and and, and we we'll come get rid of them. So we have to take him through the process and make him understand the where the danger, okay, where the exposure to our fibers could even come from. And it's not just from having these things on your roof. Over the past 20 years or thereabout, there's been a slight improvement in the awareness. And when I say slight, I mean very marginal improvement in the awareness level of the uh, danger of the harm as best as school pools. But it, it is still abysmally low. It is. It is Um, 
factors surrounding asbestos in the country, then you can begin to understand why it is not given the uh, primary or, or, or the primacy that it deserves within the scope of things. The, the, the regulation I mentioned earlier, the National Environmental Regulation, deals com it deals comprehensively with asbestos. Like I said, even though it's not a national ban, uh, a national outright ban, it states that asbestos should not be used in new construction. And construction, of course, is where the um, use of asbestos is most widely uh, found in Nigeria. Especially between the between the seventies uh, and uh, and the year two thousand, you had um, an importation of over a million tons of asbestos into Nigeria. Over one point one million tons of asbestos was imported into Nigeria, and this is not surprising because uh, we are talking about the oil boom days when there was such a wide um, large scale construction of mass housing. In the country, uh, the first the FESTAC state, and all the various state governments um, carrying on mass housing developments all around the country using the cheapest possible material that they could find. And this, of course, was asbestos. But now we're seeing 30, 40 years later, due to poor management. A lot of these buildings are degrading. A lot of the ACMs are beginning to um, lose their um, fairness and releasing fibers into the into the environment. Unfortunately, I think has been mentioned by both uh, Moyo and Norman. We have an acute lack of data in Africa as a whole and in Nigeria in particular. Okay, so we do not have any. I've tried, and God knows I've tried, to get data about how many people have actually been, um, have actually lost their lives or suffered from asbestos-related diseases. And uh, as of the year 2018, uh, we, we, we had the 140 documented asbestos-related uh, diseases in the country. That is in the country that had imported and used over 1.1 million tons of asbestos in a, within a period of 30 years, it's totally impossible for you to have such a ridiculously low figure uh, of people that have been af affected by asbestos. It's not possible. And because, of course, we all know how, or most of us know how asbestos, um, the acute, na the, the chronic nature of asbestos disease is how long it takes. You are talking of, um, 15, 20, 25, even as high as 40 years before the effects begin to manifest, there is um, a difficulty drawing the nexus between exposure and effect in the country. All right, and not just in, not just in Nigeria, but across Africa, there's, uh, it's very difficult for people to associate exposure to asbestos with the effect that they eventually feel, uh, they eventually suffer 20, 25 years down the line. By the time people who work in the construction industry, who work in the manufacturing industry, uh, people that work for the uh, organization that manufacture ACMs, uh, get to leave the workplace. Wally. Hello, Wale. Okay, I think I think he's and having begin a... to suffer the effects of asbestos. Begin to suffer the effects of asbestos 15, 20 years down the line, first exposure. Okay, I am quite low. And people would rather um, supernatural sources. Why let's hang why let's hang let's hang it there. Let's hang it okay. there for now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. You want to start talking? You know how difficult. Thank you so much. Very, start. very put. <laughs> I honestly, honestly, I know that I know how that is. Thank you so much, Wale, for a well put together point, and I would really appreciate that. Is Alex here? Uh, why we still at the panel session? I want to. I'm just asking if Alex 
Fakuha still here. Alec, are you still here? Here. Okay, please. Alec, Alec is one of our colleagues in Canada doing very brilliant, brilliant work in the field of asbestos. I have to bring in him because he has a, a short time to leave this meeting. So I just said I should bring in him to please share, share a few things with us while we, while we return to the panel session. Alec, please go ahead. Thank you, Ehi, for this wonderful session. I'm sorry that I have to leave uh, by two o'clock. Uh, I'm from Canada. I'm the coordinator of Asbestos Free Canada, and we've been on the same journey that you've been. We have around two to 4,000 deaths every year from asbestos cancer from exposures a number of years ago. We have around 250,000 exposed workers still today from asbestos that's still in a lot of uh, workplaces. But we did ban asbestos in 2018. And for everybody in the group, we had to fight against the powerful Canadian asbestos industry, one of the most uh, significant politically influential industries in our country. And they held off a Canadian ban for decades after many other parts of the world had banned asbestos. So it was a tough, tough fight that we finally just won a little more than three years ago. So we know what it's about to fight a powerful adversary. We in Canada feel that we owe a tremendous debt to the world because from 1880 till 2012, we exported vast quantities of asbestos all over the world and many, many people lost their lives from Canadian asbestos. So we feel we have a duty of solidarity to all of you. Uh, many of you are from countries which probably suffered from Canadian asbestos, unfortunately. We now have Workplace Health Without Borders with a working group on asbestos. I put my contact information in the chat. And that working group, we're trying to use our occupational hygiene and other occupational health expertise to uh, have some impact on the struggle and on the real frontline situation of workers. We're focusing on promoting substitutes for asbestos, especially in asbestos cement, for example, roofing, and promoting implementable, workable best practices and standards that um, hopefully will mean that some parts of the world won't have to learn all the lessons we learned. You can just uh, pick up on some of the things that we learned the hard way. So thank you, Ehi. Um, I, I know we want to get back to the panel now. I have to go to my next event, but please every, everybody, I'll put my email again in the chat one more time. Uh, one person has already gotten in touch. Uh, you're all welcome to join the Workplace Health Without Borders Working Group and uh, we can accomplish a lot more together than separately. Thank you, congratulations and best wishes for the rest of the event. Thank you so much, Alec. I'm happy to hear all that you, you, you guys have been able to do in Canada. And we're just also beginning that journey and hoping that we're able to reach you to also share with us your experience while fighting this ad adversary. We will be on this journey together and we need your support for Africa. Thank you so much, Alec. We appreciate you. Thanks a lot. So, so let me quickly come back to the board. Uh, this this I, will, I will put across to Dr. Moyo. And you heard what Alex said that asbestos was just banned in uh, 2018, am I right? A few years ago. Now, from, from studies, it says the burden of asbestos disease is still rising, even in countries that banned asbestos in the early 90s. So it means asbestos has a huge cumulative effect. Countries. What happens to countries that are yet to even ban asbestos? So Dr. Moyo, you are, a, you are an occupational physician. I need you to speak on this. The cumulative effects of asbestos risk as it relates to health of those who were exposed. Thank you very much, Ehi, for that. You have brought in a very important uh, subject. Yes, we speak and we strongly um, emphasize the issue of primary prevention so that there is no further exposure. But uh, oftentimes we tend to forget that at the moment we are living with a population, um, maybe millions of people who have been exposed to asbestos in their past working lives or their past residential lives in our next to asbestos mines. And those people are at a high risk of developing all the forms of asbestos related disease. 
And um, we may end up losing focus also where we always uh, emphasize on primary prevention, which is a, in any case, a very good endeavor. But for those that have been exposed because of the long latency period of asbestos exposure, that means even at the moment, we have got a very huge uh, burden of possible asbestos related disease in our populations, including those that have banned asbestos. Because look, the effect over years becomes cumulative, even those that we, that we employed. So we are sitting with a population which was exposed and we need to put systems and practices in place in order to take care of these people who are already exposed. And that requires quite a number of uh, interventional efforts that needs to be, uh, to be put across uh, those that, that were previously exposed. Number one, you find that uh, even as we speak about that, most of these countries that they found and those that are still using asbestos, you will still find that even up to now, we have not been able to characterize the burden of the disease or asbestos related disease, your mesotheliomas, um, your asbestosis, et cetera. In most countries, we have not yet uh, even generated that evidence, which brings us to a very important issue where we need to um, bring forth that evidence, conduct evidence in order to be able to show what is the burden and the magnitude of um, the asbestos related disease across countries. There are so many people right now who are suffering from asbestos related disease who require even psychological support. So in as much as we are talking in terms of uh, primary prevention, the secondary prevention, not desirable, but with no option because it just gets to kick in. We've already have people who are exposed. And that takes us to be able to put systems in place for secondary uh, prevention through surveillance systems and also through managing those that have already developed the disease or are going to develop the disease going into the future. So it is um, a, a challenge that each and every country needs to be able to um, put up systems in place. I know oftentimes when you talk about secondary and uh, tertiary prevention, people are not quite um, interested. They tell, we tend to talk about primary prevention, yes, but remember we already have those brothers and sisters, our fathers, our grandfathers and mothers who have already been exposed and systems in country need to be uh, put in place in order to be able to manage at a secondary level, those that have already exposed, uh, that have been exposed before. So therefore, <clears throat> in as much as those that have uh, banned asbestos, it is not a time maybe to be complacent that things have done. Remember, retrospectively, you've got a huge burden that you need to deal with and manage going into the future. So my challenge, as I close, is that we need to come up with uh, systems of secondary and tertiary prevention, also managing those that are affected and those that will manifest in the near future. But above all, primary prevention still remains the key as we move uh, into the next uh, periods. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Moyo. Well articulated point. We appreciate how those points were clearly outlined. You know, ladies and gentlemen, when we when we look at asbestos or we hear about asbestos, most time we think asbestos can only be found in building materials. But studies have, have further validated the fact that asbestos can be found in a whole lot of other way, other, other products. In thousands of products such as roofing sheets, insulation materials, fire blankets, water supply lines, pipes, as well as clutch, clutches, brake lining and pads, gasket of automobiles. Most of these materials are materials that have elements of asbestos, yet we use them on daily basis or we encounter them on daily basis. Norma, I come to you now. In terms of policy in Africa, how do you think Outside focusing on where it is predominantly, uh, predominantly having the exposure in roofing sheets, and looking beyond that, how do we also, um, I mean, in talk in policy that speaks to these other areas, other products that are silently overlooked 
but yet are laced with high asbestos components. And daily, we get exposed to it. And that's why we are having a lot of stuff that we call airborne asbestos exposure. How do we, from policy perspective, speak to this also? And how do we start holding SON, standard, standard organization, of, standard organization of, of each countries and policymakers, I mean, accountable, I mean, in tackling this adversary that confronts us all? Thank you, thank you very much, Ehi. Um, it's it, it's so it's so hard sometimes, you know, to to articulate these issues. And I think Dr. Moyo will will agree with me because I think um, late last year we were we were summoned in Lesotho to come and assist in one of the hospital. Actually, there was a storm that stormed the hospital. You know, a huge hospital. And, and, and because of that hospital actually, um, where the hail actually damaged the roofing because it was roofed by asbestos. And all along actually, there was nothing said about you know, that hospital and a number of other schools in Lesotho in terms of that. But uh, because of the storm and, and the damage that you know, the hail con contained, and then we were called to come and intervene as AUDA in effort, and then we brought Dr. Moyo and other experts to come and assist and do risk assessment and give, you know, sort of like, you know, advice. And it's not only that, I've seen a couple of pictures in different countries, you know, where politicians actually, they stand in front of school taking pictures and say, we are making changes. But when you look behind them, then you see, you know, a pile of asbestos, you know, lying around. So, so when, when, when it comes to policy and also in terms of monitoring what we are doing, Firstly, for us, I think it should start from the AU level in terms of com commitment, you know, moving, moving forward in terms of these um, asbestos as well. But when we look at, you know, um, one by one what we can do, I think AU and all its regs actually we, we need to have a commitment through policy framework, such as declaration protocols and also other, you know, um, um, inter international law. Um, instruments. But also we can look at political commitments through a national asbestos policies and regulations that we need to develop as, I mean, in, in different countries. I think we need policies that can speak about, you know, abandoned mines, you know, um, recreational facilities as well, you know, hospitals, schools where you have got lots of asbestos as well. But also we can look at national asbestos strategies for the management of abandoned you know, um, asbestos mines, sites, and also factories. But within those areas also, we need to create sort of like a list of all abandoned you know, mines in our community. I think South Africa has done that actually, and other facilities as well. But within those you know, institutions where we still um, as, have asbestos, I think we need thoroughly you know, risk assessment being done, we need to list all public and private institutions in and which still has got this um, sort of like, you know, asbestos material. But also even within those, we need to have in asbestos inventories to understand where is asbestos, how to contain it. Because asbestos actually, if it's well contained, we don't have a problem, but when it's disturbed, I think that's where the problem is. So if we don't have budget, it sort of like remove everything. We need a management plan on how to contain it. So, so, so all those issues, actually, I think we need to do it. Before I come to monitoring, you know, sampling, I think someone was talking about control bending and stuff like that, which I, I'm, 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 I also res responded on the chat. But I think this is what I think we need to do. But moreover, we need to have data in Africa. I think we need to emphasize in the issue of data because data drives policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Norma. I like the way you put that last line. That, that's a punchline. Data drives policy. Without data, there is nothing that we can do. Thank you so much. We really need to start putting that together in Africa. Linda, I will come to you shortly. But before then, I've seen two hands that have been up. I'm sure they are tired of raising those hands. Let me let me call Roy Manu first. Kevin Hedges, I'll come to you afterwards. OK, Roy. so good evening. Uh, I really appreciate for this wonderful program, which has come at the right time. 
I just wanted to find out what uh, webinar is doing in terms of incorporating with the uh, international labor organization just to see how they can work together because we've seen a lot of uh, happening when it comes to asbestos such as uh, water contam uh, contamination of water depending on the disposal procedure because most of the countries have not reached at a level where they've got proper dumping sites uh, in a way that once these things have been disposed, then there's a disposal certificate given. And considering that a lot of countries have um, uh, constructed houses and structures using asbestos, maybe 70% of the, the, the population, how, we, how are we helping such countries? Is it, uh, do we have any international aid just to help the people to, to follow the, the right procedure? And also just to, to, to echo on the last point is that I, I appreciate because I didn't know about the uh, other means of asbestos, such as the uh, uh, vehicles having the gasket with the asbestos and this information has come at the right time. It's going to be a platform for us to also sensitize our people on how best they can dispose such things. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roy. Uh, let me quickly, quickly attend to your, to your question. The truth is that all Africa is on a better pedestal to start driving this course in Africa. That's why you have you have all Africa partnering with Adao Foundation and other many international organizations. For ILO, yes, we are a partner to ILO, but the truth is asbestos, asbestos desk is just finding its place in all Africa right now. So there's a new strategic project called Asbestos Control Project which of course uh, will, will be on for many years. I mean, you, you can agree with me that this is the first time we're actually holding Asbestos Awareness Week in Africa. I think we should be applauded. But indeed, after this, this, this has come to stay. It will be holding every year and we'll be, we'll be doing programs even after the uh, Global Asbestos Awareness Week so that we can have what to report to everybody to uh, when we come again the next year. So a lot of work is going to, is going to uh, continue after this program. Thank you so much for such concerns as raised. Kevin Hedges, let me hear, let's hear from you, please. Yeah, uh, so I'm sorry I'm late, Ehi. Um, and just to everyone, um, I'm actually on the board of directors of Workplace Health of Headquarters with Ehi. Um, I'm the former president, so, you know, we're kind of looking at um, international issues such as this. And I'm also an occupational hygienist. I'm also working on a retrospective exposure review for somebody who actually worked on brake pads and gaskets, um, and he used compressed air. Um, he got colon cancer, and I'm trying to put a case together to, you know, to say that his colon cancer was associated in using um, air to clean up the dust from brake pads. Um, so there's an example of if we raise awareness about using compressed air to clean the, the, the dust from brake pads, um, somebody may get exposed to asbestos. So I just thought I'd share that. And um, so, like I said, sorry I'm late, Ahi, but it's good to be here anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you so much. Like you heard, I just mentioned that earlier on, these, these aut automobile parts, a number of them have asbestos components. So Linda, I come to you now. You have a word for us. Please go ahead in this panel. Well, first off, I think the questions in the chat and the commentary with your presenters have been enlightening to me, and you really broken down some of the walls, the barriers that we might have. A couple things, um, Dr. Moya and I, maybe Norman also, I think touching on the latency period is something very important in the U.S. that we've tried to bring awareness around, because from mesothelioma, from exposure to possibly the diagnosing, diagnosis of disease can be 10 to 50 years. So I would love to work with Ehi, with Osh Africa, Ehi, and your colleagues. We have some simple uh, one-page flyers for high risk occupations, early warning symptoms, um, and prevention methodologies. And maybe we could collectively put together 
a, a board or a review team that could help us take possibly what we have so we don't have to start over or look at what some of the unions done and come up with some flyers. I mean, we have 364 days before the next Global Asbestos Awareness Week. And I think ADO, along with many others here, would probably love to work on a commitment and a strategy. Um, I also feel that multinational companies that are poisoning Africans need to help be held responsible. So ADO is working on shareholder advocacy to make sure that those U.S. companies are held responsible. And Ehi, like you commented on the seven countries that have banned asbestos and where the other countries in Africa, I think we have to hold those that import and use asbestos in a public eye so they can be known, at least workers who work there will understand they need to have prevention methodology and possibly occupational medicine uh, interaction and medical following. But we shouldn't penalize a worker who doesn't have access to care and for those who need housing, I saw this in Canada back when I was working with Alec and others in 20, 2006, what we got from an Indian gentleman who was ex mining Canadian asbestos and exporting it to Canada was his comment was a little housing is better housing is better with asbestos than no housing at all. And I think we have to have a strong paradigm shift, like working with asbestos isn't better than you know, no job at all. I think we have to educate people, let people make good decisions, but also have access to care. So those are just some of the notes I took. Uh, and I'm happy to give, I had some requests for the PowerPoint, Ehi, so I'll make sure you have it. And I just want your people here today to know that we, ADO, want to partner with all of you here in Africa and share our collective resources so we can truly end this man-made disaster. That's it, Ehi. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, while you were speaking, a lot of things were running through my mind. I think we have to, I mean, Norma has clearly, clearly highlighted this, that we need to hold policymakers accountable. I was just thinking, possibility of us starting a movement and start to sign petitions. It's important to do that because what we, in the petition, we list the countries that have clearly banned asbestos. Then we ask other countries, where are you on this? So, it's something that we'll look at after this meeting and that petition is going to come forth soon. So if you are in this meeting, you will, you will have at some point, those petitions come to you, please sign it. We need to see how we can, how we can pull this up and give as put asbestos on the center stage until those who ought to act on these legislations, they act on it. Thank you so much, Linda, for points we have put together. From, from studies also, uh, co-exposure to asbestos, co-exposure to tobacco, to, to tobacco also could increase the risk of lung cancer. I think a whole of education and awareness in asbestos exposure need to be intensified in Africa. The, most, of, most of the information that most of us are getting today, we didn't know about this. So if, if, if we, are we work within occupational health and safety space, and most of us are hearing about this for the first time, they just imagine the woman that lives in a very, in, in a community that, that's that in a rural community. So we need to make, make a vow to go back to our countries and see how we can increase the advocacy on asbestos awareness. This is where I'll come to you right now, uh, Wale. This is the education and advocacy on asbestos uh, risk. It's a huge thing I think we, sh we, we should do. What do you think, you have been at the center of this, what do you think, what ways do you think this can be pulled together where every country begin to, all the countries in Africa begin to do program on a day that we all choose. Simultaneously, the programs run in each country every day and everybody's getting the same, the same message. What's the message we need asbestos to be legislated against? Mr. Wally Bakari, how do you think we can create or intensify education and awareness in, on, on asbestos across Africa? You need to help us out here. Is Wally still here? Yeah, thanks, A. I I think, um, personally, uh, I, I believe that one of the major um, points of focus um, in the, in the um, fight against asbestos diseases should be in the management of waste. Um, that's what I think. Um, addressing 
um, asbestos in a, in a holistic manner uh, might meet quite a bit of resistance, especially when you're looking at the fact that um, most of those that are actually using asbestos in the present time are, are doing so um, for economic reasons of, because of the um, ubiquitous uh, nature of asbestos right now. And we know that asbestos on its own left on left on undisturbed actually doesn't pose very much of a risk to people. All right, it becomes a risk when it degrades, when it's disturbed, when it's um, affected in one way or the other. All right. Now, if you look at if you look at Nigeria uh, as a case study, the greatest danger or the greatest risk from asbestos exposure uh, has been mostly in the area of demolition, reconstruction. All you know, um, there's a lot of redevelopment. Uh, that have been going on over the past 15, 20 years, especially uh, with, large, with old houses being bought up by all these developers and being demolished, all right? And in the course of demolition, they break down the roofs, they break down the ceilings, they break down the, 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 the floor tiles with absolutely no uh, precautions against asbestos and exposure. And that's where most of the risk has been at least in Nigeria over the last couple of decades. Um, the rapid expansion in construction work um, in the last few um, years has also increased very much the exposure to asbestos. So I think uh, to asbestos um, um, hazards. So I, I would think that if through OSH Africa, we can um, synchronize a and you see, that you you find that if that can be if, if that can be managed or that can be achieved, then it will percolate. If you, if we can through OSH Africa, to the African Union or an African wide basis for serious movement of asbestos waste. Anybody that's going to work on asbestos has to handle asbestos. Uh, containing materials hazardous, double bag disposed of properly before you work on asbestos. Uh, containing materials, then you must meet minimum levels of um, education. Of education, when I say education, I'm talking about education on the way or uh, enlightenment on asbestos. You must have a minimum, uh, a minimum level of precautions put in place, not just uh, getting the, the Buildings, but in managing them afterwards, um, if, if we can, if we can through Osh Africa, we present something, we present a petition to the African Union at the, at the next meeting, um, requesting or, or asking for the union as a body to come up with some kind of convention of managing asbestos waste. Then we will be well on the way to controlling the menace of this uh, material. Yes, eh? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Wale. That was well, well put together. We appreciate that. But the truth is, I just like the way you pull those points, but the truth is the outcome of this meeting, we are going to have a white paper out of this meeting. And we need this white paper to be, to be taken to African Union. And that is what we're doing today. So this meeting is being recorded. And from this meeting, we'll create a white paper that will be submitted to African Union. And that's, that's one thing we will do out of this. But one thing, one thing I'm looking at here is, can we also, also look for a way? Because when you, when you talk about the risk of asbestos, yes, in as much as we are able, we, we are able to stay here, that African Union has to be accountable, country leaders have to be ahead accountable, why not let also look at it from the enterprise level? Because a lot, a lot of companies make asbestos. The, the truth is that if if banks or if people begin to know the risk inherent in asbestos, when the risk inherent in asbestos becomes so known, even when asbestos is available, it will not have any market. 
So when we bring out the risk inherent in asbestos through education, even when asbestos is in the market, nobody will buy it. Why? Because they know it is risky to them. This is some education and campaign I think us Africa will be looking, looking into in the next couple of weeks and months and we see what result and traction that we can generate before we come here to meet again uh, sometime next year. So ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I want to uh, pause now so that we can get some questions, some feedback. But before then, I want to bring to the, to I want to quickly bring to the uh, microphone somebody who has also worked with, with Linda on, on the asbestos uh, across Africa. I am aware that uh, um, Deb, Debbie Mayer, are you here? Debbie Mayer, are you here? Won't you just, so just share a word with us on the kind of work you have done with, with, uh, with uh, Linda. Is she still here? If Debbie is not here, it's Claire, Claire Dickin. Are you here? Okay. I don't think so, Ehi. We'll have to. Okay. I'm here. Okay, who is here? Debbie. Oh, Debbie. Oh, great. Oh, Hi, Debbie. <laughs> Yeah, we want to hear from you on your thoughts on the work you have done with Linda in Africa on asbestos. Is Debbie still here? Anyway, maybe she's having a network issue. While we wait for her network to get stable, Roy Manu, you, your hand is up again. You know, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I just uh, want to give uh, feedback on the impact that uh, this uh, program has caused in, into my life this evening. Uh, I appreciate in the sense that uh, whatever has been discussed, I've taken note and uh, just a plea to, the, uh, for, to, to be given the materials through the PowerPoint presentation or dropped our emails so that as we conduct the awareness training in our various countries, we're able to have some reference points just to connect with uh, this uh, powerful information. Otherwise, mine is just to appreciate for this timely program, and uh, we hope to see more of such programs in future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roy. That's, that's, ve that's very inspiring, yes. But I want to ask everyone here, once we have your email addresses, one thing we want to do is to put everybody in Africa asbestos prevention movement, which will be one of one of the one of the strategic projects again campaign for by Osh Africa. If that's if the, if you if you feel otherwise, let us know. But but outside of that, we want to put everyone present here in the African asbestos prevention. Um, control movement so that we take this up in going forward and we're able to talk to others and building capacity, having more training. Because the truth is that we can't keep having this all, every day. But when we train everyone, everybody come here, we train ourselves, you are released to go back to your country and see how much you can do. So we build capacity amongst everyone and you are released to your country to see the kind of change that you can make. One of the key issues we're, we're playing with, uh, with uh, Osh Africa National Institute of Occupational Health and uh, AUDA, we are considering doing a road show across, across Africa, but will be done sub-regionally. The road, what, what's the essence of this road show? We want to be able to engage policymakers. Asbestos will be one of the key items that we'll take along in our road show. We want review of legislations, improvement of of work conditions across Africa. I mean, you are aware that we're doing, we're reviewing the OSH policy of the 54 African countries. But I make bold to say here today that amongst all the policies we have reviewed, we will find out that some countries that have almost zero policy. So you imagine what is what will the work has been using as a guide, I mean, in creating safe workplaces. So we are we are on this together. This is for us, this is by us, because this affects us. No one, no one can solve Africa problem where Africans who are in the center of the problem go to sleep. 
The time for slumber is over. We all have to wake up because why are we waking up? What we do not fix, our children become victim of our, of our quietness. So we need to speak out. I, I tell my son, I will speak out. I will write what I need to write. If I am no more here, you are looking for what I have done. Go and ask Google. Google will reveal myself to you and all I have done. So we need to all stand in this space and begin to speak out because it's no longer about us. It's about generation next, which is the future of Africa. We all have that responsibility. We are morally bound to do what we know is right. The leaders ahead of us may have betrayed us all, but we are the modern day thinking Africa. What they took, we will not take it. What we did, what they couldn't do, we will do them. Why? Because we have to safeguard the future of our children. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the cross of the matter. No one is standing alone. We all stand alone together on this issue until we are able to build the Africa that we want. Anyone that says he or she is happy about the condition and the state of Africa today, that person is only pay lip service. We are not happy. Africa needs to change. And the change agents in Africa, we are the ones seated in this, in this meeting this evening. So thank you so much. I welcome uh, uh, Norman to, to, to give his comment as he wants to. Norman, that, 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 that may be your closing remark, actually. Thank, thank you very much, Ehi. Let me anchor what you're saying. Um, and, and, and also appreciate the people who said to come listen to these um, wonderful speakers speaking to us on a Friday um, evening. Um, I wanted to also add to what you're saying that, you know, I think within the African Union Development Agency, a number of, you know, activities, including OSH Africa that we are taking so that we can raise the flag of occupational health and safety that includes, you know, asbestos, silicosis, TB, and other issues as well. There are a number of, you know, um, legislations learning from South Africa, um, because South Africa actually has overhauled actually a lot of, you know, their, I mean, um, 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 laws and legislations. Um, currently, I think we're embarking on writing um, an occupational exposure limits, you know, standards, you know, generic thing like a generic, you know, standards for, 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 for industries, because we've realized that in many countries we don't have such, you know. So we are developing something, something like that. And also at the AU level, we are looking at, you know, sort of like um, a protocol that will govern, you know, occupational health and safety and compare our countries where countries actually can sign and commit, you know, on increasing awareness in terms of all these, you know, in, information that we're getting. And I'm telling you, in some countries, actually, because of these um, um, many, you know, multinational countries, I mean, companies coming to these countries, and some of them this disregards, you know, occupational health and safety. The same company that in Australia or America, actually, that um, that applies a stringent rules in terms of, you know, silicosis or asbestos. When they come to Malawi, you find that they use a different standard. So we are trying to look at that. So we are really asking you know people to come to commit to the work of osh africa and also african union development agency as you said we are moving towards you know the agenda 2063 it might not, it might not be enough what we're doing and we are not enough actually in african union development agents but when we count on you thank you to assist us thank you very much thank you so much Norman. That, that's that's well said and that is that is the, that is the right word and that is the future together we move Okay, um, where is uh, Moyo? Are you still here? Your 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 closing remark. Thank you very much um, for to all the participants and the presenters. It's been an absolutely momentous uh, occasion as we talk about awareness to asbestos and its effects. I think going forward, one of the major issues that we need to cascade in our different countries is on capacity building in the field of occupational safety and health so that we are able to create that um, broader um, view in terms of awareness, uh, in terms of capacity building, so that we are able to spread the word. But above all, we also need to embark on uh, evidence generation, evidence-based practice. Let us be able to characterize the burden of these um, problems in our countries. We should be able to 
uh, say even without uh, much difficult say the burden of asbestos related diseases in Malawi is 0.1 percent or 5 percent across right now we do not have those statistics maybe outside South Africa so it is uh, it is incumbent on us to sh make sure that uh, we move and progress uh, issues of capacity issues of research uh, in um, occupational safety and health so that we are better able to characterize uh, the burden uh, of our um, uh, occupational diseases, including asbestos-related diseases. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Moyo. Thank you for, for those passing notes. Wale Bakari, your closing remark. Right, uh, right. thanks, Ehi. Uh, thank you to Linda. Uh, wonderful presentation. And like I said, uh, wonderful to see you again. Um, all the other presenters. Um, Great work done by everybody. And um, everybody that joined the webinar, um, really chuffed that your enthusiasm and the, your willingness to become part of this movement. Um, I, I, I just like to say one last thing, please. Um, and this comes from uh, my experience with people when I talk to them about asbestos. Uh, the knee jerk reaction is always go rip off anything that contains asbestos in your homes or in your workplaces. So, Please do not do that. Asbestos removal, asbestos um, handling needs to be done carefully and it needs to be done in a safe manner. Uh, leave your asbestos roofs in place as long as they are not broken or degenerated. They need to be removed in a safe manner, um, taking all the necessary precautions. All right, uh, while that is on, we can then continue to look at how to get legislation in place uh, through OSHA Africa and other such bodies for the better management of um, asbestos. Now, working in the United Kingdom, asbestos awareness is compulsory for everybody working in construction. It is part of the law under the asbestos, um, uh, ECAM, asbe asbestos awareness, Camp, uh, control of asbestos um, in workplaces. It is compulsory that everybody must have asbestos awareness training. All right, and that is the kind of thing we should be looking at pushing um, continent-wise, uh, continent-wide, and in our individual countries. Once people know what they are, what, what the hazards, what the is with asbestos, there'll be more care taken and um, more lives will be saved. Thank you, every, thank you very much, everybody, um, for this opportunity to talk to you. Osh Africa, well done. Thank you so much, Wale. Thank you so much, Wale. Such a great party note. Uh, Linda, I want you to give your closing remark. Well, I think this has been an enormously eye-opening opportunity for all of us. I think collaboration is huge. And I am so excited when I think about what we can talk about next year, because we have 364 days to build on. Ehi, I stand in your circle of support. Count on me. We need you in the U.S. And the U.S. wants to help you in Africa. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Linda. But before, before we go, let, let's, let me quickly say no dose of asbestos, no matter how little it is, is acceptable in Africa. No dosage, no matter how little it is, is not tolerable. So we must stand on our word and see what we can do. Like I just left in the chat room, while we, while we leave here tonight, let, let's try. If, you, if you're on Twitter, just, just, just tweet tonight. No asbestos exposure in Africa. Tag Africa Union. Tag Osh Africa. Tag me. Let's let's start from there. We'll take this discussion from there. But but trust me, the outcome of this meeting it will land, it will end in African Union's office, and we'll push from there and see what best we can do. So I must say at this point, thank you everyone. Your being here tonight is a show of commitment. Many of you went through the through the rigors of going navigating to and through work your workplaces, and at this time you ought to be sleeping. You are still here. This is the commitment we all have to show to our collective future. We can never thank you enough. History will not forget what we have started together tonight. But on the long run, the, 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 the future that we desire for our people, it may not be built today, but someday it will be built. 
whether we are here when it gets built or not is not the issue. But history will remember that we set the pathway that will lead to that future, safe future for our children. I must thank everyone. I will be reaching back, reaching to you at different times. I mean, in continuation of this discussion, please don't we, when we knock on your door, please open to us. This belongs to us all because this concerns us all. Thank you so much, everyone. And I wish you a happy night rest and a great weekend ahead. Thank you so much and God bless you. Good night.